<laughs> Get my eyeballs on fleek. Hi guys, Obi Dave here. And I am Ash. Together we're Obi Dave and I am Ash. With smooth eyebrows. Yeah, with the smoothest. Mine are so smooth they disappeared. <laughs> just just <laughs> wiped them clean off. God knows how that happened. Uh, <laughs> in the UK, it is Remembrance Sunday today, which is. It is. It's usually, I think, the closest Sunday to Armistice Day. Yes. Which was the 11th day of the 11th month. Of the 11th hour. Of the 11th hour. Um, And it's sort of the day that we sort of celebrate the military uh, past and present, really. Mm -hmm. It started because of the First World War, and it's a way that we wear poppies and we raise money for... um, What's the fund? It's literally the poppy appeal, isn't it? It is the poppy appeal. But that goes towards all things military. Yeah, Uh, so ex-military, obviously servicemen and women who've been injured during active service. Uh, It also goes to the uh, families who've lost Yeah, Yeah, like a benevolent fund sort of thing. Yes, absolutely. And we've got the poppy appeal, but also I think uh, Help for Heroes gets involved quite heavily as well. Help for Heroes, like... Uh, and I'm not going to get too much into the weeds with this, but so many charities, they give like 3 4% of actual donations to the good cause. It's really common in this country because yeah. people get paid quite a lot of money for certain roles and it's only a percentage after profits that goes to it. Help for Heroes is something like 98% of the money donated goes towards veterans and yeah. good causes and stuff. So they're, they're a really good charity. Um, That's where I did my wedding favours. Is it? Yeah. It was really sweet. So you got a little lapel pin hmm. and then a little card saying, obviously, uh, two or three pounds had been donated in your name. Yeah. And um, they sent me like a really long thank you letter about obviously doing it, which was super sweet. Yeah. And I think most of my friends, even long after my divorce, still have the lapel pin. So nice. Went to a good cause. Outlasted the wedding. Outlasted <laughs> the marriage. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. The, and it's not just about our troops. It's about allied troops. And it, it always has been. I mean, the First World War affected most of the world, didn't it? Yeah. Um, And it's sort of about us and our allies. So that being the spirit of today, we're going to do a couple of military-based reactions. Um, We're going to do the uh, the first Medal of Honor ever recorded. We're going to do now. Obviously, that's uh, an American award. Yes. So this is is US troops. And after that, we're going to do the Fallen of World War II, which uh, is... It's a deep one. Yeah. It's a really deep one, but obviously that covers allies. That also covers Russians, Germans. It's absolutely everyone. Absolutely. I I would like us to have a look for one in regards to the civilians, because I know we wouldn't be able to react to it on here, but the BBC did a series, one of the Remembrance Sundays, I think one of the years, uh, about obviously the civilians that were involved, like a lot of the men and women who are working like uh, munitions factories. Yeah, well, it was mostly women, wasn't it? That was when women essentially got the right to work for the most part, because they were in the factories. And then when the men came back from war, the Mm. women we used to work in, and it was like, yeah, look look how capable yeah. we are. That's it. And I follow a guy called, uh, well, his name's Ian, but he's a YouTuber's channel's uh, Forgotten Weapons. Yeah. And he did a whole week on the British military rations, well, sorry, civilian rations um, with the ration books. And apparently he, obviously, according to his channel and what he said, the British were the most well-fed civilians throughout the Second World War. I mean, we had the yeah. day for victory and things like that. We had like a that. lot of help from the Americans. Yes, like yes, those, we did. ships and ships full of supplies coming. Yeah, absolutely. But, I think the whole dig for victory thing, which was a huge campaign in the UK, plant veggies in your garden, raise chickens, whatever you can Mm. to to fill that caloric deficit that people had. Yeah. Um, Everyone talks about climate change nowadays and things like that, and we all can't do loads about it. We can't stop people flying on private jets and stuff like that. But we can all have some backyard chickens. We can all grow a few veggies. You can grow stuff on a windowsill in your house. More wildflowers, like. Like having less organised gardens with, you know, so parasitic... Um, I'm thinking more so there's less gas mileage on the food we're eating. Yeah. That's that, more the frame I come from it. Yeah. So I think the whole dig for Britain thing, we need a dig for the world. And anyone who has the available space should be growing a few veggies. Yeah, definitely. If you grow carrots and then swap them with your neighbour for a few potatoes, and then, especially when people are trying to go potentially cashless economies and stuff... Let's all start trading again. Yeah, I agree. You're not paying tax on swapping some fucking turnips with some potatoes. No, I know. You know what I mean? I'm reducing but food waste, but we, we are digressing. We're massively, massively. digressing. Um, but that's what we do over here. And if that's your thing, make sure you subscribe. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is the first Medal of Honor ever recorded. Wow. Let's go for it. Chapman, a U.S. Air Force combat controller, and the SEALs are attempting to rescue their lost teammate. 
You'll watch Chapman's heroic actions as he saves the lives of his entire SEAL team and then another 18 members of a quick reaction force, earning America's highest award, the Medal of Honor. Oh, is it thermal image? Yeah. Chapman and the SEALs exfil their MH-47 helicopter. John is the second individual to exit and immediately moves in the direction of the summit. He can be seen moving off to the right of the screen, alone. The team is taking heavy fire from every direction, as indicated by the arrows, as Chapman begins engaging targets. You can see spent cartridges ejecting from his M4. Chapman then begins closing with the enemy, forcing his way upslope in knee and thigh deep snow. He is constantly under fire as he does this. Chapman's team leader begins to close on Chapman, following his trail through the snow. The dark mass above Chapman is a fortified bunker containing two enemy fighters, each armed with AK-47s, who are firing down on the team in the darkness. This bunker will come to be known as Bunker Number 1. To the left of the tree and Bunker 1 is another gray mass. This is a rock outcropping that came to be called the Boulder. Between Bunker 1 and this boulder can be seen the body of slain seal Neil Roberts, the man Chapman and the others are attempting to recover. No man left behind. Chapman, still alone and closest to the enemy, pauses to engage targets as his team leader follows him, but never actually catches up with him. Chapman, on his own, now makes the decision to charge directly into the enemy bunker, despite withering point-blank fire. Chapman, now literally on top of the enemy, engages the two combatants and kills them, saving the lives of the remaining SEALs. He does this from a distance of no more than 10 feet. These actions, by themselves, earned him his first Medal of Honor. He then climbs into and takes control of the bunker. Having cleared the immediate threat, Chapman is then joined by his team leader in Bunker 1. You can then see Chapman and his team leader engaging the next bunker, known as Bunker 2, which is situated to the left edge of the screen. This bunker, manned by a handful of Chechen and Uzbek fighters, also contains a heavy PKM machine gun, hand grenades, and rocket-propelled grenades. John Chapman is shot twice at this time in the torso and collapses, incapacitated. Shot twice in the torso, so that's is that upper or lower torso? They suppose they don't de- specify. They but... didn't specify, uh, but at this point, he's already earned the Medal of Honor. You know, for for bravery. I mean, and like to, to rush a bunker like that under heavy fire, and they're in a fortified bunker yeah. on your own. Well, these guys are pinned down. You saw when they got dropped off mm. by the chopper, and it was just heavy fire on him. But he was sort of whether it was foresight or luck, he he sort of separated himself from well, the group well they're in the dark he says so it's quite possible that because he was split off and the the rest were sort of bunched in that the enemy were focusing on the bunch yeah because that's all they can see uh it must be incredibly difficult to see in the sort of lighting especially when there's snow all around you and like it's saying if yeah. it's knee or thigh deep he's he's probably well hidden not yeah. particularly well but With it, i mean the i presume the americans are going to have night vision goggles mm. and possibly the afghans and the chechens and stuff don't uh, and their, their military sort of uniforms as well, like, you know, um, camouflage would have been absolutely immense, especially at that time of night, would have been perfectly yeah. concealed. This this to recover a body. That's the mission, is they, to they, recover an ally. Well, know. it went cold, so that he must have been alive for some time. Maybe they didn't know he was... And they didn't they, know he was incapacitated, because yeah. then as you're watching, like I kept looking over, you can see the colour start to fade out. Yeah. So he's obviously he's losing the heat he's, after it's he's a, gone. It's a crazy way to watch something like this, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's just, yeah, it's, yeah. You are now looking at a new angle and at the left of the screen can be seen the two-man fire team and team leader on top of the boulder. Just below it is Bunker 1 with the mortally wounded Chapman. One SEAL can be seen firing his modified M60 machine gun from the hip into Bunker 2 on the right side of the screen until he is struck by grenade shrapnel and tumbles 10 feet off the top of the boulder, collapsing at the feet of his team leader thus setting off a chain of events that would lead to the SEALs abandoning Chapman on the summit. 
The wounded SEAL and the team leader can be seen conferring about his injuries. Moments later, the SEALs decide to retreat from the summit because their position is untenable in the face of continued massive enemy firepower. They can be seen moving toward the right side of the screen and passing the body of Neil Roberts. Unfortunately, the SEALs do not pass John Chapman, who is above them and inside Bunker 1. This angle shows three SEALs in a triangle. The larger black heat signature is a smoke grenade. Just to its left is a donkey and dead Al-Qaeda fighter killed by Chapman. The steepness of the mountain can be seen as the seals begin to slide down the near sheer face. Injured as well. The team leader, desperate Jesus. for relief and now with two wounded teammates, asks for uncontrolled airstrikes from an orbiting Air Force AC-130 gunship. That's terrifying. The impacts you see are from 105mm howitzer rounds being fired onto the ridgetop in order to save the remaining SEALs. Because neither the SEALs nor gunship know Chapman is alive, he is experiencing these detonations from his position. That's what I was going to say. He's up there. They said mortally wounded, but he's alive. He's alive. Up there yeah, they, they they didn't pass him, so they have no idea. They probably think he's down in amongst them, but then by that point, it's already made the decision to leave. Yeah, or well, they so might they can't go back. They might think he's already been killed. You know, just... but they've gone for the body. That's what they. Uh, but usually, the the procedure would be is to take no no man left behind. So even if he was dead, they would have taken him. But they didn't know he was there, so they probably assumed he was down already out of the bunker when mm. they start to radio. So, you know. Um, I think under that Retreat. heavy fire, though, if, if he was, because he was ahead, if he'd been killed, they'd have to search for him, wouldn't they? And they didn't And have time. maybe when they started this mission, they could already see from the drone that the guy was there, so they knew what they were doing. <sighs> yeah. Like, at this point, these guys don't know where he is, do no, they? No, they don't. It's just absolute bedlam. But to there. request un uncontrolled, you know, drum bopping, droppings is terrifying to be in that position to just be like, yeah. even if you hit me right now, we need it, that risk. Yeah. It's crazy, isn't it? Unreal. At approximately 5.20 in the morning, Chapman recovers and begins to engage the enemy. Bunker 1 is on the right side center of the screen and Bunker 2 to the left near the screen center. How is he still it will going? never be known what caused his incapacitation and recovery. Of the two rounds that originally wounded him, at least one was mortal and at this time he is experiencing severe blood loss and shock. Jesus. Despite that, he begins his one-man stand against two dozen enemy combatants. During this time, Chapman initiates a series of radio calls, many of which are heard by a fellow combat controller and teammate of his and Delta Force operators on a nearby summit. Despite this combat controller's replies, Chapman never acknowledges whether because of damage to his equipment or himself will never be known. This new angle and footage shows Chapman at the top, identified by the green dot under the tree at Bunker 1. The lower center of the screen shows the first enemy fighter who is about to charge Chapman in the hopes of killing the American. The timestamp at the bottom shows it is now 6.05 in the morning and fully light. He's been fighting alone now for 40 plus minutes and has received more gunshot and shrapnel wounds as a result of the fierce combat. This scene shows the second of several enemy charges. In this stunning display of determination and courage, Chapman can be seen fighting hand-to-hand -hand with the fighter. In the larger screen display can be seen additional enemy moving on to the summit. But right now, John Chapman is fighting for his life. Six minutes later, in this new shot, Chapman can hear another helicopter approaching the summit. He is in the bottom center of the screen underneath the tree and can be seen in the magnified inset box as he begins his desperate final stand to save the lives of the 18 men on the helicopter. The red dots are enemy fighters. John begins engaging the enemy in multiple directions and is rapidly approaching the last of his ammunition. The helicopter contains a quick reaction force comprised of rangers, pararescue men, and another combat controller. It is now 613 and the helicopter is short final. The enemy is desperately trying to displace Chapman so they can put heavy weapons or rocket-propelled grenades in Bunker 1 while simultaneously engaging the helicopter. With the choice to save his life or the lives of his unknown comrades, 
Chapman makes the decision to climb out of the bunker and begin firing in multiple directions as can be seen in the inset. Suffering from as many as a dozen wounds, Chapman is in fact already in the process of dying. As he fights, the helicopter is struck by a rocket-propelled grenade and makes a remarkable controlled crash just below Chapman and the summit. Chapman, now off-screen, continues to cover his comrades as they pour out of the stricken helicopter. Some of them are fatally shot as they exit. These images, with Chapman fighting the enemy at close quarter, are the last to show him alive and in this heroic act, thus qualifying for his second Medal of Honor. Ultimately, Chapman would expend all but the last few rounds of his ammunition, until, finally, after 16 bullet and shrapnel wounds, Chapman succumbs when he is shot through the heart. We will never know his final thoughts or words, but what we do know is, his decisions and actions single-handedly saved the lives of 23 comrades. For more information about John Chapman's amazing story and the details about this mission, visit danchillingbooks.com or your favorite book retailer to obtain a copy of The Chronicle of His Life, Alone at Dawn. Unbelievable, isn't it? Um, it's... I've I mean, I've, I've always I'm had a, 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 I, I'm choked up, but... I, I mean, I've, I've always had a deep, deep, deep respect for the military. I mean, like I've, I've told you stories, like I wanted to join the military here. Mm. And my grandfather was a, a Lancaster bomber pilot and was held in prisoner of war camps for two years during the Second World War. And it, it, to, be, to have that drive and determination when you're bleeding out and being shot constantly is immense. Like A proper badass, isn't it? It's it's just unreal, unreal. I, I think he was in bunker one for hours, you know, after being shot a couple of times, and has probably thought he died. You well, know, that's probably it. Passed out and yeah. it's freezing cold, full of bullet holes, and then bleeding out. He's, he's obviously just come to and been like, right, I'm in the fight still, and he's just gone for it. It's, you can't even comprehend. No, something you, like that. You can't. I don't think there's even training or anything that could prepare you for something like that. But some people do just are meant to protect you know the um their civilians and obviously their their country but yeah. that um that helicopter would have been shot down sooner oh uh, it probably would have gone yeah. completely and, and it probably everyone killed everyone. everybody yeah and i guess the second medal of honor was for the fact that he yeah. saved everyone on well not everyone on board because some people died they will as soon as they got out oh, that wasn't his yeah he wouldn't yeah. have been able to stop that it's just crazy isn't it like um, what, what an absolute hero unbelievable hero I just hope they they don't say obviously that they recover his body, but the fact that they know about how many bullet holes he I had, pre- yeah, I would I, assume that they've managed to recover him. I think they will have done. Or how the rest of them got off that summit, because obviously, like I said, eighteen people got out of that helicopter. The, the, the guys uh, that the guys that were in the helicopter crash would have had to secure that location for another helicopter to come in at some point if it did. Yeah. So they would have had to have ended the enemy and recovered his body I presume in that process they probably yeah you, you can't just guess that he had 18 shrapnel wounds or whatever it was you know and, and sorry yeah. other wounds. I've seen that with the office blokes a few years ago now and it's still it's, it's a hard watch it really is but it makes you so proud of people like you know like they say right restoring he, uh, faith in humans yeah it's stuff like that Absolutely. that restores a lot of my faith because it's I can't remember the full quote, and and it's, I think there's been argument that it wasn't Churchill, but Churchill says there's rough men stand ready to defend those who sleep in their beds. So something like yeah, that. Yeah, it's paraphrasing it's a bit. It's paraphrasing but, yeah, a bit, yeah, yeah. but it's basically saying that there's men like this who go to war to defend those who are innocent. And that's just absolute, you know, like epitome, a picture of it. This yeah. guy just defending the men he, he stood by. That sort of um, ultimate sacrifice thing, you know, of choosing others over yourself. Yeah. I grew up watching war movies with my dad my whole life. And Same. whenever someone did that and ran out into gunfire, I was sat there like teary. Yeah. It's always got me that massively. Same. And uh, it's, yeah, it's just, there's nothing more you can do for people, no. is there? Than- it's like, it always makes me think of um, that episode in, you know, Band of Brothers, when he climbs over the um, that little mound, you know, in, the, in that ditch, and he just charges out ahead of everybody. Yeah. And he does it because they're being pinned down and they don't think there's any way out. I mean, obviously, they, they secure the location and he surprises them. But to, to think like that, to think, okay, 
I'm just going to, you know, give them a chance to get out and just throw points. my life out yeah. on the line is such a sacrifice for human. It's, it's crazy, isn't it? And people like that just keep us safe at the end of the day. Yeah. That's it. I, obviously, I'm paraphrasing the thing, but rough, red, rough men stand ready to defend those who... I don't remember the full quote. I'm sure someone in the comments will yeah, correct me, yeah. but... Wow. Right. Well, I knew you'd find that sort of heavy and but yeah. it's, it's amazing as well what an unbelievable story unbelievable uh, i have a look at the book have you read some of the uh, military books in what way like what? you know like when soldiers write like you know ghost stories you know? I, I um i've read a couple of andy McNabb's books i, I know people have debunked a lot of bravo to that's, zero yeah i was gonna say that's, that's one of them that i've read but i tend to listen to jocko willink's podcast where when someone's wrote one of these books he gets them on the podcast and they discuss certain elements of it yeah. and stuff. I prefer to listen than to read a lot nowadays. Um, but it's, you should listen to that at some point because some of the stories do. on that are people that have survived things like this and yeah. they've written a book and then they're explaining it with a former Navy SEAL. And it's, it's done really well. Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. up for that. Right, cheers for that one, guys. Make sure you like and subscribe and all that good stuff and uh, we'll see you soon.